Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's weekly recap video where I'm gonna answer questions from all of last week's videos. And to be completely honest, Erin gathered most of these questions this morning and I have not read them yet. <laughs> so usually I help pick out questions and then I can kind of process like how I'm gonna answer them. Um, so this is gonna be interesting. So let's just jump right into the first video which was planting in my parents' garden. In that video, I just loaded up the truck full of beautiful perennials, a few annuals, and we took them out to my parents' house and planted them. And it's really fun to get out of your own space and it's really fun in particular for me to go out to my parents' garden because that was the garden I grew up in. It's just a very peaceful place and it's a mature garden. And so, I don't know, it's full of shade and beautiful plant specimens. So it's always fun to be there. Jim said, I know in another tour of your parents' garden, you said the bishop's weed was there when you were a kid. So speaking from personal experience, would you ever plant it in your own garden? Nope, <laughs> I can enjoy it looking at it out in their garden, but I will never ever plant it in my own garden because it takes over so fast and it wants to run everywhere. And they've got it fairly contained, like it's been in that same spot since I was a kid. And I remember having to cut it back, like that was one of my chores. Uh, and I always, <laughs> I always hated that, um, but they've got it fairly well managed. I just don't wanna have to do that here. No, thank you. It is a pretty plant though. Uh, Nancy said, do you follow any rules about planting around the roots of trees? Are there rules for planting around the roots of trees? Erin, are there rules? I don't know. I just plant where I want to plant. Typically, when I am planting under a tree, if I run into a branch, or a, not a branch, a root rather, that's maybe like this size or bigger, I don't cut it. If they're little tiny roots, I don't mind cutting through those, especially if it's an established tree because that's not really gonna set a tree back. Um, anything larger, uh, like, I don't know, what is that nickel size or bigger? I try to leave alone and dodge. Um, typically, I don't deal with a ton of roots, especially in my own garden. If I am planting something directly under a tree though, I always make sure to give it extra water because those plants and the tree are competing for moisture. Um, and depending on the tree too, like if it's a willow, definitely extra moisture, like everything needs its own emitter plus drip tubing. Um, if it's underneath something different, it may not need quite as much water, but those are some of the things I try to keep in mind. GT says, how do you deal with snakes or do you not have any? Snakes ruin gardening for me. And I know that's a huge deal for a lot of you guys. And like, I don't love the idea of a snake being near me in the garden either. I don't mind it if I know it's there. Um, if I've seen it, I don't like when I stumble upon one and usually they don't, they don't move until you almost like step on it and then they move and freak, freak you out. I don't love that, but you know, we don't have a whole lot of poisonous snakes anyway that come down into our gardens. Like we get just regular garden snakes, maybe bull snakes. Um, but like we do have rattlesnakes in our area, but they're typically in the hills. I have never seen one, even in my parents' garden, which they're right at the edge of like rangeland where there's a lot of rattlesnakes, but they never had any in their garden. And so typically like I look at snakes and think the snakes are here because I've got a healthy thing going on here. Like they wanna be in this garden and that's a good thing. It's kind of like when you have a lot of frogs or something in your garden as well. Harrison says, how do your parents find time for weeding and what do they use if they do not hand pull? Do they hire help? Um, they do hand pull, they don't use any, like they maintain their gravel like we do here, which we'll link the video down below of how we handle our, our gravel driveway because they've got some of that as well. Um, but in flower beds, we all hand pull. That's all we do. We don't even use tools um, to help us weed just because we wanna make sure to get the roots and we just keep them on a really tight schedule. And it's something that you do have to be fairly diligent about. Um, but if you stay on top of it, the weeds really just never have a chance to get out of control. Um, and it's something I've had to learn through the years. And of course too, when I worked full-time job, when I was working, oh, a lot of hours, I was working like 7.30 till after six at night, five days a week. And then I oftentimes watered in the nursery on the weekends. Um, so I didn't have a ton of time at home. Of course, my garden was a lot, a lot smaller, but I would have to save all of my weeding and garden maintenance for weekends or evenings. So, you know, it wasn't like I had time every single day to dedicate to being out in the garden. So I totally can feel you guys, you know, that are working full time. It's really hard to juggle. Right now we keep our garden on a very strict schedule to where every day there's an area of our garden that gets handled in terms of weeding and deadheading. That way we can kind of stay on top of it. But my parents do occasionally hire help for certain things like trimming boxwoods and trimming trees, um, things like that, like bigger projects, but they do the bulk of the maintenance themselves. Cotton State Country says, I have to remind myself often that I have to build my garden through the years. 
not all at once like I'd like to. There's no way to get the look of your parents' gorgeous garden instantly. That is so the truth, but it's my goal. I have to have patience and just keep at it for the long haul and quit trying to do it in one spring. Yes, I included, I actually picked that comment out. I told Aaron we needed to add that one in because I think that that is such a good reminder. You always need to step back and think, you know what, this is a process. Like this process will probably never, ever, ever be done. You know, even when you get some of your things to maturity, like all of a sudden you'll have a storm or you'll have a disease sweep through and take out something huge and mature in your garden. And it's just how it goes. And it's just an evolving process. And we all have to step back and be okay with the fact that it's not gonna look 100% like perfection all the time and all the years that we have the garden, if that makes sense. Like it takes time to build that mature space and it takes time to hone um, the garden, depending on what your style is and our styles evolve too. So sometimes we are wanting to remove stuff and put something new in, if that makes sense. So, I mean, we're all in the same boat when it comes to that. Like there are a lot of pretty spots in our garden, but there are also a lot of spots that I want to change drastically. Um, and it's just going to be a process. And yes, I would love for it to all be perfect all at one time. That would be amazing, but it's just not reality. So anyway, let that be your reminder for the week. Dawn said, can you share how your parents met and a little of their story of how they got started gardening and with the seed company, please? So, seeing their garden is such a treat. So my mom grew up in kind of a gardening environment. My grandpa was a huge gardener in terms of vegetable and produce. Uh, and his garden was always amazing. They didn't do a lot in terms of flowers. They had a few rose bushes in front of their house and that was pretty much it, which is crazy to think now that, you know, you look at their garden now and it's just like this huge, immaculate flower garden. Um, but she also would go down to this little pop-up greenhouse that would set up down the street from where she lived every year. I think like maybe when she was nine or 10, she went down there and asked if she could like water and help tend to the plants and they let her, which gave her a little bit of experience that way. But it's always kind of been in like part of her. My dad didn't really grow up in the gardening realm. Like my grandpa gardens too. Um, but I don't know that my dad was ever really involved in that part of his life. And so my dad started though at Andrew Seed Company when he was 17, he was sweeping floors and loading alfalfa seed. And that was kind of what his job was. And he eventually got to work himself up in the company. But kind of in the early days, like my uh, parents met when they were in their late teens. My dad was working at Andrew's. My mom was working at a sandwich shop downtown, just very nearby. And my dad would go down there for lunch every day and they eventually asked her out and they dated and ended up getting married. And then they just, you know, kept on going with Andrew Seed and they were able to eventually like buy more and more into the company. They started the garden center portion in 1990. And yeah, the other interesting thing is that sandwich shop that my mom worked at burned down at some point. I mean, I was probably, I was young. I can't remember what year it was, but anyway, they ended up moving the sandwich shop to my parents' property. So there's a building on Andrew Seed property that is now the sandwich shop that they met at. So that's kind of a sweet little piece of history that lives on. Yeah, so let's move on to the next video, which was planting creeping flocks. I finally got my hands on some gorgeous in full bloom flocks that I just wanted to show off to you guys. And they were both varieties that are going to be available next season. It's always fun to get them in the ground and get a little bit of experience with them first. And I think they're gonna do really well where they're planted. Jessica said, your Anna's magic balls have fantastic color. Do they hold their bold yellow color all year now? I remember when you planted them, they were much more green. Yes, so I did do a mini tour of that area as well after I got done planting the flocks. So there were a lot of other questions about different types of plants that were in that area. Lots of questions about the Anna's magic ball. And those do retain that bold yellow all year long now. They bronze a tiny bit in the winter, not as much as the fluffy arb, um, which we planted in the back formal garden. That one bronzed out quite a bit. These maintain fairly well and they're just like this hugely bright, beautiful spot in the garden and so petite, which makes them so easy to fit into flower beds. I love them. Uh, Jessica said, do you have to cut it back? Mine struggled this spring because I pulled out what I thought was dead. Typically what I'll do, like right now they're starting to fizzle out a little bit. I'm gonna go in and kind of shear them off maybe by like half or so, just to clean up the straggliness that's on the top. And that will encourage a little bit more like, um, side shoots, I don't know, it'll, it'll make them dense and thick and a little bit nicer looking. Otherwise you can cut them back like, you know, in the fall or late winter, early spring, just to clean them up and get them ready for the next season. Anne said, what kind of trees did she say those are? The ones in the cans that we haven't planted yet, those are Corinthian lindens and I'm so excited to get those planted. They're a really amazing tree with amazing, like the most neon yellow 
fall color ever. And we've got a lot of red point maples around here. I like red fall color as well, but I really like yellow. I love seeing that brightness in the garden, so I'm excited about those trees. They're still not planted yet. Kim said, you mentioned the phlox as a ground cover. Does it spread fast? Would it take a, uh, would it overtake a garden bed? So that's one of the good things about this, some of these newer varieties of creeping phlox is that they're not as aggressive as the older varieties. Sometimes you want that, but there's often times when you don't, and I don't want aggressive phlox. I don't really want to have a massive carpet of it because it's a one season interest plant. You know, I mean, let's be honest. We like to have, you know, lots of different plants so that we have lots of different interests throughout the year. So I don't really want it to aggressively spread and take over this space and be beautiful for its bloom time and then just kind of die out and there's nothing else really around it. So I wanted something that would stay a little bit more compact. Jennifer Parker said the cluster of red flowers in the background are lovely. What are they? Jupiter's beard? Yes. And I kept calling them Centauria, which is mountain bluet. Jupiter's beard is Centranthus, Centranthus ruber. I should probably double check that. <laughs> Hold on. I don't know why I get those so messed up. It's They're probably similar. Red Valerian is the other name. It is Centranthus. Red Valerian, Jupiter's beard. Um, yeah, they both start with the C, so I get them mixed up. But I think I called the Centranthus Centauria in a couple videos this week. So anyway, you guys know what I meant. It is an amazing perennial. It's kind of like salvia. It comes up and blooms and perennial geraniums. Um, they come up and bloom almost all at the same time. And then I cut them all the way back. Uh, red valerian salvia all of those things I cut all the way back and then they flush back really fresh and nice for a second bloom time later in the season Amy said love these videos and I'm tempted to move to zone 8 so I can plant some of the same beauties you show she uh, lives in a zone 10a anyways I know it's not related to this video but what would you do differently with your kitchen veggie garden I'm planning one right now and would love to know I don't know that I would do anything to oh no I would I wouldn't miter the corners of the raised beds don't do that. <laughs> Wood warps. And I just thought because mitered corners, you know, that are cut at what, 45s and then put together, I, they just want to warp and they kind of spread apart from each other and they look a little bit like they're starting to fall apart a tiny bit, even though they are held together by metal L brackets inside, you can't see it. So they're not going to come apart but the wood appears like it's starting to split apart. So I would just put your wood like this, like just meet your wood up together like this. It'll still want to warp because it's just in the nature of wood to do that. But mitering, I think makes it much more prominent. Um, I don't know though, is there anything that you can think of that you would want different? I love the size of our beds. They're all three feet wide, not four. Four is just too wide for me. I want to be able to reach from one side of the bed to the other so I don't have to constantly get up and go around the bed to reach stuff. I love our kitchen veggie garden space. I think it's just absolutely wonderful. I love that space. Uh, Shelm said, I have a salvia that's doing pretty bad. I totally forgot about watering it and it kind of fell over. That makes sense if it got dried out. I planted it anyway and deep watered it, but should I cut it back all the way down? Yes. If something like that happens or your plant shocks when you plant it, I would definitely cut it back because then your plant won't send energy into trying to keep the shocked leaves and flowers and stuff alive. It'll rather send energy into producing new growth. Um, so definitely keep it nicely watered um, and yeah, do that. I was also like, I kind of, when I very first read that question, I always think like salvia that flop in the middle, like what do you do with things like that? Um, and I don't know if you guys have issues with that. There are some perennials that want to flop after a certain amount of time. And there are several reasons for that. Um, one could be like Russian sage, for example, and salvia. If they don't get enough sun, they are generally weaker plants. And so when they start to bloom, the blooms are so heavy that they want to make the plant flop over. That could also mean too much water. It can mean over fertilized soil. Um, and sometimes it can mean that the plant is just like, getting some age on it. And you know, all perennials have a lifespan and sometimes you need to divide your plant, you know, dig it up, break it into pieces and move it out so that it has a chance to kind of re have a, have a new life, I guess. Um, and sometimes it just needs to be replaced. So those are some reasons for that. But in your case, I think it was because it probably didn't get watered. Um, and just definitely cut it back and keep it well watered. Uh, Patty said, I'm curious if you were to move, are there any plants you would have to dig up and take with you? Or could you walk away from them all? I think I could walk. I think I could walk away from them all because all plants are replaceable for the most part. And there's nothing like usually the stuff I would want to take with me are the things that are established and mature and looking amazing. And you wouldn't want to disrupt their, you know, happiness by digging them up because if they're like this amazing specimen, it's probably something that they're really happy where they're at. 
Um, you know, most plants you can replace in terms of you can find the same varieties again, sometimes. Um, I would probably take concrete with me, <laughs> to be honest, like not all of it, but some of my pieces are just like, I can't leave them behind. And you can replace concrete too though. But like I brought those lamp posts that you gave me for Christmas because those have, like I say, I don't get sentimental about a lot of things, but I do. Like some of them have some, some memories behind them. I have two beautiful lamp posts Aaron got me for Christmas one year um, that I would bring along with me. Um, anything that I would have a hard time finding um, but like, I love the Esplanade urns we have on the west side and I would want to take those with me, but they're such a, a like huge part of that garden design that I would probably need to leave them and I could order those again from Unique Stone. So it's all those things I'd have to like weigh out and decide. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think that uh, you're not so much a, a collector of plants. Um, and so because of that, you don't have like you know, you're not into like rare plants, like you don't do rare plant hauls and things like that. Yeah. So um, because of that, I think mo your type of gardening are usually like easily accessible plants that are oftentimes like new to the market. Yeah. And so it's like, well, yeah, Although, you can just buy them because either that plant is available or it's improved version right. is available. Yeah, now. you're right. I think the things I have the most of though, in terms of collections, I have a lot of roses. I have a lot of David Austin roses in the garden um, and I have a lot of hellebores. I have a pretty good hellebore collection, but they don't like to be moved. So that would be probably a, uh, something I would need to forego. Next video was planting up containers for neighbors. So we got a huge load of containers from uh, Michael Carr Designs and Proven Winners with the Aquapots. And this past winter, we, un we unopened, we unboxed, <laughs> we unboxed this huge palette of pottery and there were some really beautiful things. So some of them fit with the style aesthetic of our house and some of them didn't. And so we decided we would keep, like I'm looking at the beautiful gray one we planted up with a hosta and a fern, it's still doing beautifully by our front door. And it is an aquapot self-watering container. So I wanted to keep some of them around here, but then I thought, you know what, since some of these are like, there's some that are bright red and some that are um, like kind of more modern looking that don't quite fit, there's probably other homes I could, you know, give these containers to and they would really enjoy them. And it's, you know, since our neighbor's houses, we can easily go and like help them if they have any questions with the plants or if, if any questions about the self-watering capability uh, and to get updates to show you guys. So anyway, it's really fun to be able to do that every once in a while. Um, so our first question was from Becky Boops. Those self-watering pots seem to have a huge hole in the middle. How do you plant it without getting all your dirt falling in the hole? That hole is actually, is it like called the soil sleeve or something? That hole is meant to be there because you wanna pack soil down in it and that's where the moisture wicks in. So that soil acts as the wick and then draws it up into the rest of the reservoir of the pot. So that's how the pot is designed. Um, anyway, no worries there. Anna said, where did you get those pot feet? They're so discreet. Would love to be able to purchase. So I believe they got those at my parents' garden center because I do, I don't know that they still have that exact style. They're like little terracotta wedges and they do kind of just go right under the containers beautifully. And the reason why I put them underneath that container, even though it's self-watering, is that in case, you know, like we've had a lot of rain this weekend, which is very atypical for us, or like if you accidentally overflow the reservoir, the water will come out of the overflow drain. And so um, it will settle under the, the pot, like most other containers. So if you have it raised up on pot feed, it's really easy to like use a blower and blow out all the extra moisture from underneath so that you keep your surface relatively clean. And that's the reason why we did that. But they are really nice in that you can't really see them. So it doesn't matter really what color they are because they kind of just disappear underneath the pot. Aaron and I though, no, Aaron, you ordered them. I didn't order them. You ordered those little black, they're like kind of hard rubber mm -hmm. squares. We should, we should find the link to that. We'll find a link on Amazon. There are these like little squares this big and they come in a pack of maybe like 12 or uh, super cheap. They're awesome to put underneath containers because being black, uh, you, they kind of disappear underneath the container. You don't really notice them. And they're just, I don't know. I use them with all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, NL Maverick said, hey Laura, why do some labels for flowers have lines saying propagation prohibited? I mean, most flowers are just super easy to propagate ourselves. Perhaps there are some legal stuff attached to it. And there, there is, I mean, you'll see that on, especially I see that on a lot of succulent tags. And the reason for that is, is that these companies or breeders or whoever has the patent has spent a lot of time and a lot of money producing this specific breed of plant and they will hold that patent to the plant so like when you when somebody buys them it kind of just prohibits somebody from being able to propagate them and sell them that's the main thing and i think it kind of like falls under the umbrella of like you shouldn't propagate them at all 
but that's like telling somebody that you can't divide a perennial in your garden. There is no such thing as a propagation police who's gonna come knock on your door and check your garden to make sure you have a receipt for every plant that's in your garden. I think it's mainly set in place so that like big growing operations can't steal the genetics of a plant and propagate it without like paying the royalties for having that variety because somebody has spent sometimes their life creating this certain breed. It's kind of like David Austin Roses is one I can think of just because it's on my brain. I just said something about David Austin earlier in this video. Um, you know, he spent his life, he recently did pass away, um, which is tremendously sad, and he spent his life breeding these roses. You know, it'd be like somebody coming in and being like, oh, hey, sweet, thanks for breeding all these wonderful roses. I'm just gonna take all the work you did, propagate them, and sell them quick, um, while not giving either credit or royalties to David Austin for his lifelong work that he did, if that makes sense. However, again, there is no propagation police <laughs> that will come to your door. I think when you're doing things at your own home, like we propagate succulents all the time. We divide perennials all the time. Like we're perpetuating a plant's life and we're making it into more lives, you know, instead of just the one that you bought. In our own gardens, that's just what we gardeners do, but we're, most of us aren't out there selling it. And I think that's where the line needs to be drawn. Do the right thing. Do the, yeah, do the right thing. <laughs> Uh, Katie said, how do you know when to refill the aquapots? You can't see when the water level is low, so do you just refill once a week no matter what? Or that is my only thing about the aquapots I'm still trying to figure out. I think for most people, in most cases, a once a week refill is probably just standard. Um, now, we haven't put ours through any heat test yet because we've had a few hot days, but nothing like, you know, our 100 degrees that last for weeks and weeks. Like, like today, high is 70. I'm in a long sleeve sweatshirt this morning because it's chilly. Yesterday's high was 58. It's just so weird. So I haven't really had the chance to really put our aquapots through the rigors of hot summer, which might mean for us we have to refill more often. We don't typically get a lot of rainfall. Um, for those of you who live in climates that get a lot of rainfall, I think it's just kind of living with the pot for a year and kind of figuring out what, you know, what they need. I was thinking about like creating a very, uh, like, what is it, like a, a rough version of a float? Is that rudimentary. rudimentary float system where you get a cork and maybe like a long skewer or dowel, like a really lightweight piece of wood of some kind. And before filling up the reservoir, like putting that all the way to the bottom and then making sure that that, um, so there's a cork at the bottom with the wood dowel stuck into the cork. And then the dowel is long enough to come to the very top of the water tube that you, you know, put your hose in. And then you cut that dowel so that it's flush. And so then you can start filling the reservoir and as the reservoir fills, you see that, you know, the dowel like coming up. So you can kind of see where the water level is. I think that would actually work really well. And if you have it done from the start and you have it done per the size of your pot, you know, the height of your pot, then you could easily tell where the water level is. Otherwise, like I talked to Jack, who um, was the designer of Aquapots, and he said a lot of times you can see when the water level's getting close to the overflow, it'll kind of start to spit water a little bit, and then you know to stop watering. You can also hear it sometimes, but that's kind of hard sometimes when the overflow is up against a wall, um, like ours is. It's fairly close to the wall, so it's kind of hard to get my, like, my ear back there and hear when the water level's close. So that's just something I feel like that's the one thing that Aquapots is missing is a way to indicate because like with our other self-watering containers we used out along the fence line, those were plastic. Not as pretty as aquapots, I'll give you that. But I could tell based on weight um, how much water that reservoir had in it. Because when the reservoir was full, those pots were heavy. And when they weren't, they were very light. And I could just like move the container around. So it's easy for me to tell, even if it didn't have a float system, where the water level was. So that's where I'm at. I'll be reporting back as we use them more here and as we get some warmer temperatures, how they're doing. Uh, next video was flower bed makeover. We went to one of our friends' homes and we just had fun setting up a drip system. We weeded, kind of cleaned up their front flower beds and then just planted them full of things. There was annuals, a few perennials, grasses, and some rose bushes that I think were really pretty. It was a fun project. Kelsey said, those planters are great. Where are they from? <laughs> That is a great question. I bought those at my parents' garden center. They oftentimes buy a lot of their pottery when they go to buying shows in the fall. And I don't know if maybe they came from Washington Pottery, because I know that that is a supplier of theirs, um, or has been throughout the years. I could try to track down a, 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 a wholesaler for that, but I'm really not sure I would be successful because those pots, let's, did I buy them two years ago? I can't even remember. 
They're beautiful. I think they worked out perfect down there. Um, Jaime said, where do you buy the brown drip tubing and connectors from? Those are all Dig Court brand from Home Depot. Uh, Nika says, what is the drill you use to plant the roses? So that was a impact. <laughs> it, was a, <laughs> it was a stud and joist drill. High impact. No, DeWalt high drill. impact is, it was DeWalt. <laughs> it's we'll, a put De a, we'll put a link. DeWalt stud and joist drill. Yeah. Seven inch auger. auger. From power planter yeah we'll put links to both of those things down below because i clearly don't know anything about them they work well uh denise said are you just doing this for family and friends or are you starting a new enterprise right now we're just doing projects like that for family and friends like we have another home lined up for um, some friends of ours in fact um one of the, the guy who helps us with editing our videos ken we're gonna go out to his house and plant some things i'm really looking forward to that it's something i would love 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 to do more of especially like for some nonprofits in our area um, there is a nonprofit we're going to be hopefully getting some containers taken down to and planted up. It's a uh, children's relief nursery, which um, deals with um, children that, you know, are coming from abusive home situations and something that like really um, weighs on me a lot. And so I really want to get involved down there. Of course, we were hoping to do the projects earlier on this spring and then with, you know, everything that was happening, uh, everything kind of got pushed out, but I would love to go down there. Um, Gardner Supply sent out some beautiful things like some bird houses that you stick to windows because there are classrooms at this place and you stick them to the window and birds can make nests in them and then the kids can see uh, you know what the birds are doing and I think that's just so sweet so anyway that will happen later on and I would love to do more and more of that as we can. Ador Adorable Deplorable said how many camera batteries do you go through filming an episode of Garden Answer? So it depends on the variety of video if it's one of my vlogs I'll typically go through maybe two or three vlog camera batteries uh, most of the time. Some of the times I have a GoPro out with me if I'm like setting up a camera just to catch what I'm doing. Um, and I'll usually go through one or two batteries for a GoPro. How many batteries do you go through like with our Canon cameras? One or two. Usually. One or two? Yeah. We have a lot of backstock batteries and we've got like Aaron has, it's a camera room. It's kind of like a glorified closet, <laughs> but it's really nice. There's like cupboards and he's got this really long um, power strip with chargers and there's just batteries and chargers and we can go swap out batteries as we need to. Um, yeah, it just depends on the, the video. Next video is Flower Alley part four. In that video, I planted out the last three containers for our Flower Alley. So there are 10 total uh, containers out there. They're doing really well. I'm so thankful we had 65 mile an hour wind gusts this weekend and I was so worried, especially about the coleus that I put in there because you guys know coleus. It's an amazing plant, but it, these are not very protected from wind and coleus can be a little bit susceptible to breaking and damage that way. And they all made it out beautifully. And the whole point of Flower Alley is to show you guys some smaller containers with more simple container arrangements, like uh, maybe utilizing three or four different plants instead of like a bunch, which is typically what we do. And I know that there are situations for both sizes of containers and, and both scales of projects. So, Samantha said, this year I got some new pots and filled them up with things I've seen you grow and someone just asked me who I hired to do my containers. I feel like I've learned so much from watching your videos over the years. I hope you feel that all your work you guys put into this channel is worth it because from my end, it definitely is. That is so sweet and so encouraging and sometimes I just need to hear stuff like that, that what we're doing is helpful and that what we're doing has made an impact on you all and, and your gardens and that's just so sweet. Samantha, thank you for that comment. Casey said, when using the drip tubing, does the length of the tubing affect the quantity of water that is supplied due to water pressure? Yes. Does the emitter help control that? Does the tubing with the drip holes have any water pressure problems? We have found with our system here, we can run like the half inch brown drip tubing with the holes, emitter holes every 18 inches. We can run typically, what is it, between 400 and 500 feet of that yeah, 450. about 450 between four and <laughs> well but that's better the more exact is better so about 450 feet of that tubing um and that's about max to get nice flow from all of those but different emitter holes if it's a grid oh yeah uh, i don't think you can do that if you just run you're right for one end and run it. right so we grid everything so we can do 450 feet of the half inch brown drip tubing if it's in a grid system which means you have your water access and then whatever your area is you create a grid system so you do like 
what if it's a circle or a square you do your your section around the outside and then you run the pieces on the inside i guess you could say while tapping into both sides of the like outer ring and that way all of it's connected together and there's never an ending point so the water just kind of like flows back into itself and somehow the pressure is really good you know i've asked aaron if he would put together a an, an irrigation video for all of us because i would love for him just to like spearhead a video explaining all of the things that he's learned throughout the whole process of us getting our property set up on drip because drip and sprinklers and everything because it's intense and there are so many different pieces and parts to make different things work and you need different I don't know you need like a different configuration for everything you do and it's so it can be so frustrating and I can't imagine if you're just starting like learning about drip and not really knowing what to get like it's frustrating to have to learn through all of those things and Aaron has had to do that throughout these years and I think you should Aaron. Everybody like everybody let him know in the comment section that you want a video about irrigation because it would be really helpful I think. Like if you took us around and just showed us like everything that you've done, um, you know like for the new garden space versus like getting all the hunter things set up versus like drip um, set up from a hose, all of those things and talking about all the flow and pressure issues and all the lengths and all of that. Like all in one video, nicely packaged for everybody. He's going, I have to do it every day. Uh, next question was from Depressed in Wondering, why you use Espoma potting soil over the Proven Winners potting soil? Or do you use Proven Winners and I just didn't notice it because I feel like I've seen a lot of Espoma bags in your videos, but I know you love Proven Winners products too. So I'm curious if one is more suitable in certain situations. You know, I've used both of them. And as you guys know, we work both with Espoma and Proven Winners and I'm hesitant to say that one is better than the other. Like I've had really good luck with both of them, but a couple of different things. I do think that Espoma potting soil is easier to find for a lot more people. I think the distribution is a little bit more um, vast, I guess fast. <laughs> it's just easier for people to find and I, that's important to me. Um, when I'm looking at different things and wanting to recommend something to you guys, I always want it to be decently easy for you to find. Um, so that's one of the things. And also I do like the fact that Espoma's potting soil is organic. And I know with flower gardening, flowers and containers, it doesn't matter as much. But when I do edibles and containers, that does matter to me. And so I just kind of go with the Spoma and just do it straight across the board. And I really do have good luck with their soil. Uh, Penny said, just curious, does Proven Winners send you certain plants to use or do you choose the ones you want? I choose the ones I want. Um, typically, like I put in an order in the like late fall, early winter. They do like it if I try to incorporate some of their new stuff in just so I can get some experience with it and show you guys a little ahead of the game so you can start thinking about it and seeing if it's something that you want to put in your garden based on what, like how it's done in my garden. And that is fun for me. I love to be able to do that. Even if it's plants that like doesn't have the exact same shade of, you know, I don't know if like it's a red plant. Like I have some red begonias in the greenhouse that I'm going to be using. And it's interesting because they're new, even though red isn't something I typically put in my garden, I do like to try all new plants, but no, they never asked me to put anything in particular in my garden. I do what I want in our space. There's a lot of freedom there, which is really nice. Uh, Rachel said, how often are you watering the pots in Flower Alley daily? Yes, they are on a drip system right now. Um, I think, did you back off on the watering? They were getting water twice a day when it was like 98. Um, like 10 minutes, we'd run it for 10 minutes twice a day. Right now they wouldn't need it as much because it's been a lot cooler, but that's the beauty of a drip system. You can kind of adjust it however long you need it, but they will get daily watering no matter what, um, just because we get a lot of wind here and they just tend to dry out, when, they, especially when they're in smaller containers. Okay, next video was planting a few things I've never grown and that was really fun. I've just kind of gathered a few different plants throughout this spring. They've been sitting out by our greenhouse for a long time and I just keep like walking by them and looking at them and thinking, oh, I need to get those planted. I need to get them in the ground. Um, so I planted some meadow sweet, some gompho carpus, which is a type of milkweed, acanthus mollus or bear's breeches, and then some oryngium uh, sea holly. And it was just like a bunch of unique looking plants. Uh, Lady Daisy said, Laura, this is a formal garden. Proceeds to plant thistles and meadow flowers. <laughs> True. Um, however, I don't know. I think you need a little touch of, of whimsy in there. I love formality and I love like boxwood hedges and beautiful concrete and like statement kind of gardens, but I like it when they are backed by something a little bit more cottage feel. So you kind of have the juxtaposition of flowing and fluffy and overabundance, and then you've got your strict structure. I like those combined in one spot. So meadow flowers and thistles tend to make it in. 
Pink Cinderella said, just curious, do you have a new editor? Seems like a video, like the videos have a different feel lately. Not bad, just different. Uh, we do have help with editing. Ken helps us edit most everything. For like the last year and a half. Yeah, he's been, like he's been helping us out for, yeah, the last year and a half. Um, not like full time, that whole time. Mm -hmm. um, but he does a lot of the editing and it's, he has fun experimenting. And Aaron did too, like trying out different styles and, and things and seeing what works and what doesn't. It just, I think it's fun to mix it up a little bit so that your videos don't feel stale, you know? Because I think if you did it the same all the time, it could have that, I don't know, I would have that reaction, I think. Uh, Linda said, have you had any success with blueberries? Yes, I have a family member in Idaho Falls area and they would love to plant blueberries. Is there a variety that does better in the alkaline soil areas? No, not that I know of. Thank you for all your wisdom in plants and your enlightening videos. Um, so the way I have had success with blueberries, now I don't know what the pH is in Idaho Falls, the soil pH, and blueberries tend to like to be like what, between is it four and a half and six or five and six something. They like it more on the acidic side, which we definitely can't get, give them in the ground. So I uh, grow mine in containers exclusively and I have really good luck with them because I can control the soil that they're in. I'll use like a soil planting mix or I'll um, add in some soil acidifier in with my regular potting mix and I tend to have really good luck that way. In fact, I do have some blueberries I need to plant. I picked up like six one gallon, I think six one gallon blueberries and they're all loaded with, with fruit right now. I just haven't got around to planting. So maybe we'll put together another video when I do that. Uh, next question, you mentioned fertilizer like plantone as needed. If you have landscape fabric around the plant base, do you pull it up and fertilize or do you put the plantone on top of the landscape fabric? Uh, you know, I. It's better if you can get the, the uh, fertilizer underneath the landscape fabric. So oftentimes, like we cut an X in our landscape fabric and then fold back the flaps, plant our plant, and then, you know, put the flaps back up toward the trunk of the plant. Um, so it's really easy just to like reach in there and just pull back one of the flaps and just toss your fertilizer under. That way it makes contact with the soil. It's much quicker to get to the roots of your plants. If you're putting it on top of landscape fabric, I just don't feel like, I mean, eventually water will break it down and we'll push it through the landscape fabric, but it would take forever. I just feel like that's not as good of a way of doing it. I mean, if that's the only way that you will fertilize, if, if you can just toss it on landscape fabric, I mean, I would say do that over not fertilizing, but definitely try to get under the fabric. Um, Svita says, what does mulching a plant mean? So I talked about the acanthus mollus and, and agapanthus, which I have in my garden as well, um, and how they are more tender plants. And sometimes when you have something like that, you need to mulch them up for winter time, which protects the crown of the plant. So mulching a plant means either using mulch or leaves or garden debris and putting it up over the crown of the plant. And I did that with the agapanthus this year. So uh, like everything else in my garden was cleared up. Like all the leaves, we do all of our cleanup in the fall because we just don't have as much time in the spring. Uh, it just works for us better. So we had everything clean except for that spot right there. It was just full of leaves. And we just made sure that the crowns were covered. And then in the spring, you can gradually move those leaves away and let the plant wake up. And it just gives them like that layer of protection, insulation to help hopefully help them make it through winter, which the agapanthus did which made me excited. And the very last video, which we just put up this morning was I got a ton of planting done. So I just planted annuals in a lot of different spots. And we just decided to put it all in one video because many of you, if you've been following our videos for long, have seen me plant up these areas and these containers multiple times. And I just thought this year, let's just get it done because we're behind anyway. I just want to get these planted and yeah. So the old Reading farm said, did the chickens get to eat the lettuce that was under the boxwoods? And I had mentioned that I wanted to construct like a temporary fence around that area. I planted lettuce and let the chickens out and just let them go to town. Time just got away from us. They did get to eat a lot of the lettuce. We tossed a lot of it in their run, uh, but they didn't come out. And I just didn't have the right, the right props to construct construct a temporary fence and honestly just didn't want to take the time to do that. So anyway, that's what happened there. That would have been fun though. Uh, Marcy said the galvanized tub looks amazing and the plant combos were really pretty. Well, thank you, Marcy. That wasn't a question, Erin, that you <laughs> included, but that was a very sweet comment. Uh, next was from A. Livingston. Once planted with the slow release fertilizer, how long do you wait until you start giving the weekly water soluble fertilizer? Right away. We have everything on a fertilizing schedule. Last year we were doing it on Fridays. Now we do Mondays. It just works out better for our schedule. So every Monday, everything's fertilized. So let's say I planted those con that container on a Tuesday, it would get fertilizer the following Monday. Um, so yeah, everything just, if it's an annual, it gets just lumped right into the next time we fertilize everything. 
Kayleen said, okay, what are the summer plant, what are summer plants and spring plants? So spring plants are annuals like violas and pansies and things like that that can handle really cold temperatures and you can plant them earlier on in the season. Typically for us, that means February or March. And then we can enjoy them in containers or in the landscape for the whole spring season. So like usually it's like mid to late February in the last three years, we've had such mild winters, mid February, March, April into May. And we get this huge, long, beautiful season. And then we can plant our summer plants, which are plants that prefer heat, like our supertunias and our caladiums and coleus and all of those things, which typically replace our spring plants because spring plants don't like the heat. And last question, Joelle said, I noticed you were using biotone while planting at Versailles. Was this something you have done before? I have, I use biotone when I plant like any perennial or shrub or tree or anything like that in my garden. I've been using it a lot more on annuals this year and I use the Proven Winners Continuous Release Fertilizer as well. I just thought it would be fun to just try them out and just see what kind of reaction I got from everything. So far, everything is doing really great. I've never had bad luck with Biotone and I just thought, I wonder how long of a feed this will give versus the Continuous Release Fertilizer, which typically, typically lasts six to eight weeks. It's just a fun experiment to try. And that's it for our weekly recap. I hope this video was helpful. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, again, we have a lot of projects coming up this week. A lot more planting in the hopeful, hopefully more planting in the, the new garden space up front. We have a quarter of it done. There will be a video coming out really soon, maybe even tomorrow on the main channel, um, showing me plant up all of the stuff in there. But yeah, it's slowly coming together around here, you guys. I feel really slow this year, but anyway, it is what it is. Thank you guys for watching this video and we will see you in the next one. Bye.